Gary, can you hear me? Phil, we can hear you really well. So we are going to um, start in about one minute. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Greg was thinking that it was it, it froze up, but can you have you got us now, Greg? Okay. All right. I guess we're okay. The false panic. <laughs> Everyone, I'm Sue Knott with Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom and Education Specialist. Thanks for joining us this morning for our December virtual field trip. A few things before we get started. Um, first of all, use the Q&A if you're joining us through Zoom or the comment section on YouTube to tell us where you are from, where you're joining us. Um, already I see the Zimmerman Elementary students in kindergarten, first and second grade are here. Good morning. Um, also, if you have questions to ask throughout the virtual field trip, you can use the Q&A in, in Zoom and also the comment feature in YouTube. Um, we do have a uh, captionist with us today, so turn those features on. I'm um, closed captioning in both YouTube and Zoom, and you can have words scroll across the bottom if that's helpful for your, for your viewing enjoyment. So we are going to get started. My clock says it is 10 o'clock, um, and we have some really exciting um, information and things to see on our virtual field trip today. So we are going to travel virtually to Isanti, at, oh, Isanti, Minnesota, um, we, where we will go to the Pinestead Tree Farm. And this farm is owned by Phil and Helen Hartley. Phil is gonna be our host today. And Greg, his son is the cameraman. So he does a lot of work on the farm, but we just won't, um, won't get to see him. So before we travel to Isanti, a few more um, shout outs. We have Brandon Schools from o Ortonville, Michigan, welcome. Albert Lee fourth graders, um, Green Central first graders in Minneapolis, distance learning from Chaska, um, Lake Crystal, Martin Coney West, Mrs. Nepples, kindergartners, good morning. We have fourth graders from St. Mary's in Burnt Island, um, Sabika second graders, kindergarten Red Rock Central in Lamberton, Minnesota, good morning to you. Um, Leeds third grade class in Leeds, um, North Dakota, North Bend, Nebraska, Cedar Mountain Elementary, good morning. Franklin, Minnesota third graders, and also students from Fairbolt and Fairmont. So thank you for joining us. We are going to get started. Like I said, we're gonna head over to the Pinestead Tree Farm and Phil Hartley is there to welcome us. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, Carrie. Uh, hello everyone. Hi kids. Well, here you are at Pinestead Tree Farms in Isanti, Minnesota. And I'd like to uh, just give you an introduction to our farm and tell you what we do. We're gonna see, look at a lot of photos today. It won't be just me talking because all I can do today is just show you one day. But what we wanna do is show you the entire year. So we'll be working on that with a number of photos. Here's the, you can uh, see the entry to our farm as people drive in and um, uh, they come up to the buildings then, and there's trees in every direction from the buildings. Just a little bit of history uh, of the farm. We started the farm in 1986, so that's 34 years ago. Then we started selling trees about six years later. The trees were really small then, uh, because normally the trees take from anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 years to get big enough to harvest. But we, we kind of jumped the gun there way back. We have uh, a lot of small trees that we're planting. We plant every single year. Um, and you can see some of the small trees. And then the trees, uh, what mid-sized trees, they're starting to grow, they're starting to take shape. They're starting to look like Christmas trees now. And then the larger trees, the ones that are ready for sale. And we'll be talking about some of those trees in uh, uh, a little bit later. But to begin, begin with, let's talk a little bit about pine cones. Um, first of all, a pine tree or a spruce or a fir is called a conifer. And it's from the, uh, the trees that you have in your yard that are shade trees, the deciduous trees. Those trees have leaves. These pine and spruce and fir have what we call needles. But technically, they're leaves as well, just like on the shade trees. So here, here's a couple of cones. And these cones, you can see they're closed up. Uh, the seed is still inside. And then here's a cone that's starting to open up. On here, you still have the cone. All right, let me back up for just a minute and say, even back here, when you have the seeds like this, the, the, 
the cone like this, uh, before the seeds start, you have the male um, tree, and you can see the little cone. I don't have samples because after they release their pollen, then. And Phil, can you wait, can you wait for just the next photo shows pollen from those cones. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, Phil. Your um, signal, unfortunately. The next picture shows the pollen from some of those cones. Um, Greg is backing outside of the lean-to again to hopefully improve the signal. Uh, just for everybody's sake, we're outside. It's lovely to be outside because with our metal buildings, we lose the signal. And Greg stepped forward to zoom in on the, the pine cones and got underneath part of the metal building, and then we lose the signal. So we won't be able to do that very well. But in the photograph, the coming and it's sticking to some cobwebs so it gives us a chance to actually see the pollen. And then the third picture shows cones that are ready to receive the pollen. And then, um, so normally when you think of a pine cone, you think of something like this. And that's a cone that's opened up at the end of the year. The seeds have all been released. This is not the seed. A lot of people think this is the seed, but it's not. This is just what held the seeds. The seeds are all gone. And uh, the seeds, and I'll just take some here and, and hold them up. The seeds look like this. They look like just little small seeds. I'll just scatter some there so you can kind of see them. Around and and, uh, we uh, get planted and start start growing again. Uh, now Greg is backing away from him and staying outside the lean to. Um, our pine cones here are quite small, but in the west where you have giant sequoias and red, redwood trees, you can get some monster pine cones. Now, uh, the the trees themselves, uh, we don't grow them from the seeds. We buy them from a nursery. And here you can see a photo of thousands and thousands and thousands of small trees growing in a nursery. And the nursery grows them two ways. First, grow them as a seedling, um, which show, in, the, in the photo, you see the roots are really, really spindly. And then they will dig those trees up, plant them a second time, and that forces the roots to really start to develop. And you can see in the, in the photo there that uh, you've got a big mass of roots. We only plant the transplants because they're much hardier and there's a much greater likelihood that they'll survive in our fields. Because where the fields are not a perfect growing environment like in a nursery. Now, uh, to get ready for planting, the, the first thing we do is we go through the fields and we destump all the old stumps. We take out all the stumps that were there, and then we till the, the, the field smooth, and then we wait for the trees to arrive from the nursery. And here you can see them arriving. There's a, there's a lot of trees. We plant uh, three, four, five thousand trees a year, depending upon uh, what we feel the conditions are like. Um, the, uh, we do plant some of the trees by hand, uh, and to do that, we use this planting bar. And you can see in the photo that Reina is also planting one next to a, a, a tree has died and she's planting a new one. But this planting bar makes a big thick hole, a uh, wide hole, I should say, and allows us to uh, get the, uh, the seedling down in the ground so the roots are covered. But that's only just a few of them. Most of them we plant with a tree planter, or with a, with a yeah, tractor drawn tree planter. And uh, here you can see a photo of it, the front of it. Uh, we've got a load of trees, we're ready to go. And then the next photo shows Greg and Helen sitting on the planter. And they're getting uh, ready to drop the trees in into the, um, um, into the trench we're making with the planter. 
And I would normally be up on the tractor then just driving the, the tractor. Oh, we have so a question. Bill, oh, can sure. we ask? So this is from Jordana. She wants to know how many different types of trees do you plant? We plant six different types. And I'm going to show you not all of them, but some of them here in just a minute. Uh, and I'll explain what kind of what types they are. And um, um, then uh, Greg, uh, after we get them done, Greg mulches the trees. He puts uh, wood chips around them. And that's kind of like a, a blanket. And it just protects the trees. Uh, when we put a blanket around us, it's to keep us warm. In this case, we're putting a blanket around them to keep the trees cool. And then we irrigate them. We, uh, in our light sandy soil, we have to give them water when they're young. So he's laying this irrigation tape. And then you can see in this photo where uh, the tape is actually dripping and you can see the water. What you can't see is it's also dripping underneath the mulch. And that's the water that really counts because that's right where the tree is and the mulch will keep it really damp there. The sun won't dry it out. And then the next step is to fertilize. The small trees we fertilize by hand because we plant the trees six feet by six feet uh, apart in every direction. And that's not for social distancing. That's for to give the trees room to grow. They need about uh, six feet up, be about six feet apart so they can grow properly. Uh, and so then I, as the tree, oh, go can ahead. Can I ask a couple more questions? So Sophia wants to know, can you plant the trees all year round or do you just do it in one, one type, one part of the year? And then also how much does uh, one of those um, seedlings or transplants that you showed us, how much do, do those cost? Okay, those are both good questions. Uh, first, we can only, well, we only plant in the spring. Um, we plant the, the end of April and into May. Um, and uh, some people also plant in the fall uh, after uh, um, say mid-September, or early October. But we found we've had best, our best luck by planting in the spring. So we, that's what we do. And the, um, the, the trees cost about a dollar to a dollar and a half a piece as transplants. The seedlings, if, if you got them, would be a lot cheaper. But like I said, the seedlings just are not hardy enough to really plant out in the field. Okay, Phil, one more question, then we'll get back to, to you um, sharing. Why is it important to have, like you said, the mulch is sort of like a blanket? Do the trees overheat or, or why do you try to keep them cool? Well, what we're, what we're really trying to do is retain the moisture underneath the trees. Um, we've got very light sandy soil and the sun in the summer would just heat up that soil and would dry out the, uh, all the moisture. And then the roots, uh, the, the roots are very shallow. They're only down a few inches to begin with. And then uh, the, the, the tree would die. So we've got to make sure that, that the roots stay moist. And the best way to do that is to use the mulch to keep the, the ground underneath shaded and cool. Okay, so what we're doing is we're growing a crop then, uh, just, just like a farmer plants his corn and at the end of the year harvests it, we're planting our trees, except that it's gonna take eight or 10 or maybe even 12 years before we harvest it. And this photo shows you a, a photo, uh, one of our fields and you can see on the left-hand side, those are trees we just planted this year. And then you see some taller trees that are a little larger. They were planted last year and then the previous year and the previous year and so on. And you get over to the end, they're harder, harder to see. They're just a big green mass, but those trees were planted six uh, or seven years ago. So you can see there's just a, a continual uh, planting of trees every year. And just like the farmer sells his corn then to pay his expenses and buy uh, his seed for next year, we do likewise. We sell some of the trees to pay our expenses and to be able to buy more trees for next year. Now, as the branches begin to develop, um, we will begin to uh, do a lot of different uh, uh, steps to take care of them. One of the tools we use, our best tool, most 
is a, people would call these a clippers. We call them a Felco because that's the brand name. They're a uh, they're actually a clipper that's made in Sweden and they're very high quality. They're very expensive, but we use them for everything. And I wouldn't say to Greg, can I uh, hand me your clippers? I'd say, hand me your Felco because uh, any nurseryman, any tree farmer is going to have a Felco like that. And I used my Felco to go out in the field and clip a few branches. Um, here's the branch off of a Norway pine, which has very long needles and there's always two of them together. And the Norway pine is the Minnesota state tree. It used to be very popular for Christmas trees, not so much anymore. Um, what is still popular is the white pine. And it's got softer needles, more silky, more uh, wispy. Um, and it really looks pretty when you decorate it with ribbons and bows. And it's got its needles in clusters of five. And if you go up in Northern Minnesota, in Northeast Minnesota in particular, the Northern pine, uh, the Norway pine or the red pine as it's called, is kind of like the king of the forest. And the white pine is like the queen of the forest. And you'll see these two sticking up above all the other trees uh, in the forest. But then a lot of people like the um, uh, blue spruce. Uh, and the blue spruce is a, a prickly tree. And the reason people like it is if they have cats, the cat will jump into the tree and pull it over. Or little babies, little toddlers, might touch it, get pricked a little bit, and then we'll leave the tree alone. They won't pull the tree over either. So that's a very popular tree that we grow. We also grow the um, balsam fir, which is uh, grows, if you've ever been in Northeast Minnesota along the North Shore, balsam fir are very common there. They're a native tree in Minnesota. And they have the most scent and people like them because it gives, puts a real Christmassy smell in your house. And then also very popular is the Fraser fir. That's actually not a native tree. It comes from North Carolina, but it has stouter branches and a little stiffer and they hold ornaments well and they have great needle retention and they have kind of a little silver undertone to them. So it's uh, a very attractive tree. So um, these two trees are the trees we, we grow the most and sell the most, the balsam fir and the Fraser fir. So Phil, we have a question. What is your personal favorite kind of tree? And then also my, which, tr okay. which tree gets the tallest? Okay, um, my uh, personal favorite is the Fraser fir. And um, it, we like it because it's such a deep green and it holds its needles so well. But as far as which tree grows the, the, the biggest and the tallest, it's kind of a toss up between the uh, Norway pine and the, the white pine. There are, there's um, some of these white pine get to be 300 years old and they get to be very, very tall. And um, they're just gorgeous. Okay, now for caring for the trees uh, as, as they're growing, we do a lot of mowing. Uh, this picture I just put in is kind of a spoof. It's a picture of Helen hand mowing the trees. We don't really do it that way. What we do is we mow with, a, uh, with garden tractors. And here you see Greg uh, mowing with a garden tractor. We also do spraying for insects and diseases. We try not to do very much of that, but sometimes it's necessary. Here's a picture of Greg spraying uh, uh, old tree tumps, uh, stumps uh, with a um, pesticide to kill weevils because those weevils will come from the old stumps and infect the new trees and kill the branches. We also do a lot of shearing or shaping of the trees. Uh, and that's the biggest job of all uh, that we have is to shape all the trees. Every tree from the time it's about waist high until we sell it, which could be for five or six years then, has to be uh, shaped. We call it shearing or, or pruning every year. And we use a knife like this to do that. 
and it's got a, um, a what they call a serrated blade and then a wooden handle. And it's actually, it's very lightweight. It's actually like an oversized bread knife. And uh, we'll take it and we'll go around the tree and we'll cut all the, the branches that are sticking out. Uh, you can see in this photo here, Greg standing by a, uh, a tree, it happens to be a, a pine that has not been sheared. And you can see the, it's got several branches sticking out at the top and it's got some wild branches sticking out on, to the side. And so he's taken one of these knives and gone all the way around it, just cutting the, um, that, that new growth. And then the next photo will show you what it looks like after he's all done. Now it looks like a Christmas tree that's ready to sell. Okay, now uh, we'll move into the sales season and there's a couple of things we do. We use a lot of the branches to make wreaths and swags. And I'm gonna let my wife, Helen, this is Helen here, and she's going to show you how we make a wreath. She's, I'll have to do the talking because uh, I got the mic, Helen. Um, so she's got a wire ring right there that, um, and she's got a spool of wire. So she'll take a, a clump of branches and hold it against the wire ring and then wrap the, the really lightweight wire and she wraps it really tight. And then uh, she takes another branch uh, and does the same until she's all done. And then she's got a wreath like, and then uh, she'll take some room and some of that and uh, add that. And here's one here that she's got all done. She'll take a, a group of branches and uh, wrap them together with that thin wire again. And then she'll take and put, um, uh, here she's picking up some of the, the branches. She'll, she'll put them together and she'll put the wire around them and then she'll add the bows and maybe some pine cones and so on. Um, and so both wreaths and swags are very, very popular. Uh, for the front of your house. And I'm sure a lot of you kids have them at your home right now in the front. Okay. Now for selling the trees themselves, we sell them two ways. We sell them as choose and cut trees where people go out in the field and can cut their own. Um, what we do is we put price tags on every tree so people know what the price is and which ones are available. Because some trees we don't want to sell. We got to make sure we keep some trees for next year as well. So um, here you can see a bunch of trees with prices and then the price tags. And, and then you can see people going out to the field. They take a big, we've got these big fishing sleds. They like to take those out to the field. And then here's some people coming back from the field with the tree they just uh, cut. Now, not everybody wants to go to the field. So we also have what we call pre-cut trees. And, here you can see what, what we call the pods. So we, stick, we spread these out in our courtyard area. And then um, just before uh, we open for the season, we put, we'll go out and we'll cut trees and we'll put them into the, um, um, into the pods. And all of a sudden you have if you, a, a whole forest of trees growing right by the buildings and they're all pre-cut. They're just sitting in the pods and we can lift them right out. Um, old? Now, okay. these, these, these trees that you have cut and ready for people to buy, how old are they? How many years have they been growing? Uh, they, those, those trees there uh, would typically be nine or 10 years old. Uh, but we cut small ones, uh, you know, that are only uh, uh, five or six years old because some people want just a, what we call a tabletop tree. And then we let others grow till they're 12 to 15 years old because some people want a, a, just a real big tree for a, a, uh, for a vaulted ceiling. So uh, we have all different sizes in that. And we have another farm that's just five miles from here and we grow all these trees over there and then we bring them over here so we can save the trees that are in the fields here for the choose and cut uh, customers. 
So now we're going to show you um, after somebody has cut the tree or selected a pre-cut, then, then we shake it and we bail it. And we're going to show you a video now. This was not taken here, but of shaking and bailing. People love to watch the trees being shook. We like to tell the little kids that the tree is so happy that it was selected by them that it's doing a dance for them. Okay. Now for that's that's shaking it. So that gets all the dead needles out. So it's going to be clean when it goes in the house. Then we put it in a baler and we wrap it up so that it makes it uh, easier to tie on the car and also get through the door of your house. And here's a video that's going to show us taking a very, very large tree and baling it. And you'll see right at the start of the video, we're also shaking a tree. Uh, so a little bit of both, but this is a huge tree and it's kind of fun to watch it shrink down so we can load it on top of a car and tie it down. Phil, as we're watching this giant tree come through, how tall do you think this tree was? And how often do you have trees this big for sale? We may have lost Phil here for a moment. Phil, can you hear us? They may have experienced some technical difficulties. So hopefully Phil will, um, will rejoin us. Thank you for those of you who are asking questions. Lots of questions. I'm not gonna be able to ask all of them. You can tell Phil has lots of information he likes to share. So uh, a few things to think about. Um, we are planning more virtual field trips in 2021, our January field trip is going to be to R and R Cultivation in Roseville, Minnesota, and they grow mushrooms. So, if you've ever been interested in what a mushroom farm looks like, um, feel free to join us. We haven't set a date yet, but that's going to be in in um, in January. So, I know Phil wants to show us more about his um, his farm. Um, they do some great family events there with Santa in, in most years. I think. Oh, Carrie, are we back? You're not, but I'm just going to show us a few more pictures that um, Phil was going to talk to us about. Uh, they do a lot of fun, um, family-related things. They have some animals. I'm hoping he comes. he's able to hop back on because he wanted to tell us about their tree this year. This is their tree, and he was going to count the rings for us and help us understand how old this tree in this picture is. Um, his son, Greg, is actually connected through his own phone device. So Greg, if you can hear this, you could unmute and we might be able to ask you a couple of questions here at the end. Um, so Greg, if you're able to unmute and you can, and we can ask you a couple of questions, speak up. Otherwise, I'll show a couple more. Uh, one thing Phil really wanted you all to know is that to be a tree farmer, you really have to have a love of nature. So these are some really nice photos he took on the farm at various times of the year. Sunrise, the morning fog, our afternoon sun, sunset. Terry, can you hear me? I can hear you, Greg. Awesome. Greg, we have a couple of questions about the farm. Are you able to answer them? Yes, I can. Okay, first of all, we have, I, I think these kids are interested in numbers. So the first number, how many acres um, are is Pinestead Tree Farm? We have, uh, the farm is 90 acres, of which about 50 acres is in trees. And the other have, 40. Yeah, we have some land that's uh, used for parking, some land that's just uh, what they call fallow land that doesn't get planted every year. Um, there's some area where it's uh, 
um, the soil just isn't very, very good for growing trees. So um, we haven't planted that. Sure, and also another numbers question, how many trees are growing on your farm at, at a particular time? I would say between uh, 30 to, to 40,000 trees. And here's a question from um, Mrs. Ness's class, agriculture students up, I think they're near Sabika, Minnesota. Um, it's a technical term, but she- Oh, hello? Do you need to repeat that, please? Sure. Uh, yeah, Greg, uh, Mrs. Ness's class, I think near Sabika, Minnesota, they're wondering if you guys use, um, if you bud cap the trees. If we bud cast? Uh, bud cap, B-U-D-C-A-P. I am, we do not. I'm wondering if that's uh, co uh, covering the, the tips of the bud so that uh, deer uh, won't eat them. Um, I've seen that in northern Minnesota, but that's something that we do not have to do here. Okay, great. Thank you. So I know our time is coming to the end, and I was definitely going to ask Phil this question, but Greg, you can answer it um, for your whole family, hopefully. What is your favorite thing about being, um, about having a tree farm? My favorite thing about the tree farm, um, I like watching the trees grow from year to year. Uh, the landscape is always changing here. One year you have, you know, 10 foot trees in this field. And then the next year you're uh, um, uh, de-stumping it and replanting it. And, you know, the cycle uh, starts all over again. Awesome. Thanks, Greg, for sharing. I know um, when we did our dress rehearsal, Phil told us, and he even wrote it down, he said each day is a blessing on his tree farm. And like Carrie mentioned, he really enjoys nature and all of the living things um, that are part of the tree farm. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope that you've learned a little bit more about um, how trees and Christmas trees specifically are grown here in Minnesota and the people um, that work really hard to provide those to us. So thank you for your questions. I know we didn't get to answer all of them, um, but we hope that you stay tuned to some more virtual field trips in the future. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to check out our Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom website. It's mn.agclassroom.org. Thank you and have a fantastic holiday season.